Tequila, 1962. Kennedy, 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 Kennedy. The East Side Theater's sound system was playing tequila over and over again. The Champs' hit was hot shit at the time. The theater's lights had gone up, the music started, and then just repeated. The movie flickered, faded, then stopped. Me and the fellas just sat there, waiting for it to resume. It wasn't just another Saturday, not another Saturday morning. This was one of those late winter days between basketball and baseball seasons when instead of playing ball all day, my boys and me were going to the movies. The late winter following a Thanksgiving month of seeing the president's head shot off on network TV every day. We kind of liked Kennedy. We'd all made a few bucks putting up his campaign signs around the neighborhood. He was an exception of sorts with us, him and Mickey Mantle, and a cat named Grady. This week, we were off to the East Side Theater to see Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. We'd planned it all week, dedicated days to hustling up chump change in various neighborhood ways and, and pooled the dough. So Saturday, we were all up early and out of the house. Me, Calvin, Rico, and Doc. Doc had banked a scratch as we hustled up during the week. He was the best of us in math, and he had this thing for being fair, whereas the rest of us were somewhat shaky in that area when it came to money. So Doc always banked the dough. They all came over to my house to get me out of the back garden where I started most Saturdays, regardless of the season, studying ants. I loved to follow ants. I was fascinated by their industriousness and organization, the way they kept on keeping on no matter what. Nothing short of death thwarted them in their relentless quest for something. I never figured out what. It wasn't about any individual one of them. For all their numbers, they were all one. Nobody ever told me that studying ants was a thing. Entomology was legit. So I let it go. Letting it go was easy once I found out observing my neighbor, an occasional after-school caretaker, become Oklahoma University's first African-American football player. You could go to college playing football. I didn't see nobody going to college free for studying ants. And going to college was the only escape from beans and the blues that I could see. It was many years until I came to understand my fascination with the insignificant, if not nuisance, insect in an instant outside Santa Fe, New Mexico. The guys just figured I was weird. They called me Prof. One of them had started calling me Professor because I wore glasses and spent a lot of time hiding out in the Dunbar Library just to get away from all the crazy stuff going down in the neighborhood. As always, they came up the alley, whistling our signal, and we set out to troll the neighborhood looking for money-making opportunities. We'd already made enough money for the movie the evening before, selling Roscoe Dungy's Black Dispatch newspaper on the streets of our neighborhood. I'd even lucked up and sold 20 at one time to some of Duke Ellington's orchestras living at the Canton Hotel down on Deuce. They always set up camp down there when in town to play for the white folks' dances and jamming at the joints on Deuce in the wee hours after those dances. But the extra change from a few redeemed soda bottles or money found in alleys and streets lost by various characters and drunks who spent their weekend nights in the joints which bordered our homes came in handy at the stack snack bar, especially since we were going to the east side which had better but more expensive snacks than our neighborhood theater, the Jewel. 
The east side was across the alley from Dunbar Grammar School, from which I had recently graduated. We usually attended the Jewel a block away from my house, a merciful, fast sprint home on dark nights after seeing the Creeper or Wolfman or the house on Haunted Hill. The east side was out of our territory, a mile east past Woodson School and Butler's Barbecue, where we pooled our daily Oklahoman tips to buy boxes of rib ends after we'd sold out of papers. So we always searched the alleys as well as the streets, looking for money. Especially after me and Doc found a cloth sack full of money one summer night while playing hide-and-seek tag. You see, we were crouched in the weeds halfway down the alley between 4th Street and 3rd when the alarm at 7-Eleven went off down on 3rd Street. A minute later, a dude came running down the alley with the bag in his hand. He threw that bag into the weeds right across from us where we were hiding and cut through a backyard. We kept still, listening. We could hear the cops yelling for the guy to halt, then shots fired. End of story, you dig? There were sirens and the usual arrest opera. Eventually, I crawled across the alley and found that bag. Me and Doc climbed a tree to the fire escape of the apartments next to the Jewel Theater and went through them apartments down to 4th Street and home. The cops were just were beginning to search the alley. Four hundred bucks. We never even thought about turning that bag in. We split it two ways, spit shook on secrecy, and were the captains of our crew that summer, picking up the tabs for movies, butlers, and our favorite hamburger joint, Grady's, where grilled burgers were only 25 cents. We bought Levi's and Chuck's for the whole crew. It was our best summer together. And we made a few bucks, distributing handbills and posting signs for Kennedy, 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 Kennedy. We had that cat shit all over the hood. We'd also learned that on the mornings after the big shows, parking lots could be full of all kinds of booty. Pirate stuff, not that booty you're thinking about. Two nights before Snow White, the Ike and Tina Turner Review had played the Golden Eagle, a joint on the far east side down on the street that a tragedy would someday rename Martin Luther King Boulevard. That night, Calvin, Mike, and me rode our bikes down to check out our headquarters. See, we'd have set up a, a little camp out in the back of the Golden Eagle, between it and the railroad tracks that paralleled Route 66 through our community, from which we spied on the Golden Eagle at break time. The bands always hung out and smoked back there. On the morning after Ike and Tina Turner's show, Mike found a wristwatch with a cracked crystal in the parking lot. Calvin found a Zippo that looked like it had been run over, but still worked. I found a silver dollar, oddly not laying flat, but standing on its edge in a crack. It was strange. I kicked it. That's how I found it. It was so strange that I, I still have it. Things were looking good for the Saturday morning movie. Premier movies like... Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, stuff like that, usually got to our neighborhood a few years late. They were years old by the time they made it to our neighborhood theaters. Movies for children were rarely even screened, as they weren't as cost-effective as westerns or mystery or even horror flicks. That's what made Snow White so special. It was only for us, and kind of exotic to us. Miles Davis had recently covered Someday My Prince Will Come in his own inimitable way. And the cat who owned our neighborhood pool hall, Mr. Brown, had played the tune for us one day after school. That's the way I first heard about the Disney film, 
It's also the way I learned about the sound of music. Years later, when John Coltrane recorded my favorite things. Mr. Brown always made us listen to his jazz records while we shot pool after school. He took it very seriously, so we figured it was important and took turns paying attention to him when we weren't taking a shot. But that was the way the larger culture reached the world we grew up in, filtered through our tenuous connections to the larger world beyond the invisible walls around our world. Those who had ventured beyond the boundaries hustling to make it back with crust of bread and such. Brown's Pool Hall, various beauty salons, barbershops, and two-year-old movies. Oh, hell, I thought Lester Young was president of the United States until Eisenhower beat Stevenson. That was the first time I realized I was living in some kind of reality running parallel to the rest of the world in which prayers, our prayers, was probably an enigma. It was called separate but equal. Not that I knew it at that time, but whatever it was, we were about to get our equal opportunity to escape to escape our sepia tone lives on the board of a segregated business red light district into Walt Disney's fairy tale world. I love those cinema escapes. They were a peek into another way of seeing and being, hints of something more somewhere beyond. I got a feel for that somewhere many a night, laying in my bed, gazing out the window, listening to my crystal radio and searching the night sky for airplanes, wondering where they were bound and resolving to someday get myself wherever that was. Our routine was well established. We bought our tickets at the box office window, then stopped at the concession stand to stock up on our first course of popcorn and soda maybe even copping our dessert course at the time. If the flick promised to be particularly compelling, we wanted to stick around. For Snow White, we seated ourselves at the back of the main floor, centered against the, the wall. We could see the whole audience in front of us as well as the big screen. I remember the previews and snack bar commercials, the anticipation, and finally, the thrill of entering into that separate but equal place of disbelief suspended. Our fantasy lives were amazingly meager, and we had no clue of what we were missing. Everyday life was all too real for us, and it was always black and white, except for the assorted characters, their language, and their blood. The fairy tale notion of a pretty white girl being cared for by a troop of dwarves with funny names was just far out enough to give us psychic distance from the domestic drama and vice we witnessed every day. We took our seats. There was a Heckle and Jekyll cartoon accompanied by Charlie Parker music. The big lion roared and the movie began. I don't remember exactly when but I was sitting closest to the aisle, and at some point early in the story, I felt, as much as saw, the shadow of somebody flash past me. There was danger in the energy of that movement, and I felt it. But I was so involved with the film that I ignored that instinct. Snow White was charming the dwarves. They were so charmed, the suckers were whistling while they worked. A novel notion where I grew up, even for a sixth grade kid. But it, it looked like those cats always did it, and they seemed to love it. What followed that passing shadow was a pantomime in silhouette set against the screen. The shadow stopped down the aisle at a row where only one person was sitting low in his seat. Alarmed, the silhouette sitting rose halfway up out of his seat. The shadow pulled a pistol from his belt and took aim. The silhouette threw his hands up in front of him and said, Please! He backed away a step and fire flew from the shadowed gun. Please, he said again. The orange red of the shot and its sharp report snatched me away from Snow White's bird-like singing abruptly. 
switching my briefly suspended disbelief with the familiar rush of adrenaline. Everything got clear very fast, then slowed way down. I watched the shooter walk away amid the fleeing audience. Unfortunately, this was not my first murder. I don't think it was Calvin's first either, and I know it wasn't Rico's. I felt this rush the first time several years earlier, standing on the curb, playing cars one night, trying to shout, that's my car, before Rico and his sister Rita, thus claiming imaginary title to the passing vehicle of my choice. We, we lived just off old Route 66 before the construction of the 44 freeway bypass, so there was a steady stream of cars to choose from on a Friday night. But there was also a fight starting up that night on the corner under the streetlight where the teenagers sang harmony on weekends. Two men were arguing profanely, and, and before we could even react by backing away into my front yard, one of them snatched a straight razor out of his pocket and slapped it across the throat of the other. Everything had frozen, then melted into slow motion. The guy with the razor turned and walked away. The other man scratched his throat where the razor had struck and blood gushed out. He staggered across the street and collapsed on the, on the bench at the bus stop. That was the first time I felt that surge of adrenaline I came to identify with surviving, that survivors, it wasn't me, I'm still here, Rush. As I grew older, there'd be other experiences similar to this violent pantomime being played out before a backdrop of the radiantly cheerful Snow White and happily twist whistling dwarves. The gunshot set off a panic in the theater. Everyone ran for the exits, many of them screaming at the top of their lungs, everyone that is except me and the boys. We just sat there watching the shooting. The resultant panic and Snow White. Then the lights came on. The lights came on and the sound system started playing tequila. But the movie continued barely visible on the screen for a little while longer. The moment was unforgettable. I liked tequila. It was a hit on radio at the time. The tenor sax on the tune was definitely a rock and roll saxophone growl. The syncopation of it was infectious. I dug it the first time they played it that day. I even liked it the second time through, although that's when the screen went blank. By that time, sirens were wailing outside and people were coming in to check on the cat who'd been shot. We sat tight, low in our seats and waited. The officials went about their business and tequila continued on a loop. I, pretty soon I got tired of hearing it. The ambulance dudes rushed in and went to work, finally following eventually by the cops. White law. Serious shit. We were old enough to know that white police in our community was to be taken with serious caution. The cops looked around and asked a few questions of those who weren't able to get out. As they started to come back up the aisle, one of them spotted us sitting there in the back row against the black wall, waiting for Snow White to come back on. What the hell are you little picking in think you doing? One cop snarled. All the dudes looked at me. I was the youngest in the group, but as its bookworm, I was its default spokesman and negotiator. We're waiting for the movie to come back on, I replied. The fellows nodded, agreeing, meeting my eyes approvingly. The cops laughed. Well, son, you got a lot of sand, the policeman said. He was a big man, red-faced and white-haired, with a friendly smile. His blue eyes were mean as hell and betrayed his smile. But I don't think you're going to get to see the rest of this movie today. Can't imagine why you're interested in it anyway. Don't have a damn thing to do with your kind. He was still smiling. He pulled a dot out of his pocket and dropped it in my lap. 
Now you boys get on out of here and let us take care of our business, he said. I put the doll in my pocket as I stood up. And we filed out into the lobby. Then into the early afternoon sunlight. Suddenly the movie house magic vaporized into our day-to-day -day reality. Coming out of the movies as a kid, I used to enjoy the feeling that, that everything inside me had changed in the theater while nothing had changed out on the street. I didn't have that feeling coming out after Snow White. Nothing had changed inside me. Nothing had changed outside. We paused on the sidewalk across the street from the theater behind the crowd that had gathered there to gawk at the drama from which we just emerged. What happened, a woman asked. Somebody got popped at the east side, a man answered. Oh, the woman sighed. Will it never end? No, not no time soon, Maddie, the man said. Well, what we gonna do now, Calvin muttered. Doc suggested that there was still time to make the matinee at the Aldridge Theater down on Deuce. But Rico said there was a Tarzan movie showing there. We'd all agreed to stop watching Tarzan because he was always whipping 10 or 15 African warriors' asses all by himself. And we knew that was pure bullshit. The fact was, we knew that, that most of what we saw at the movies was pure bullshit, but there was just some shit we were not going to suspend our disbelief about. So no more Tarzan. We decided to spend the cop's dollar and the rest of our money on hamburgers at Grady's. That dollar and our change would buy us five of Grady's delicious onion grilled burgers and orange sodas, so we set out walking to the diner. The thing about Grady's was he had never practiced Jim Crow. If you had a quarter and were good for a burger, whoever you were, you got to come inside Grady's and sit down and eat. Hell, Grady never looked up from the grill anyway. People said Grady was some kind of hero. Something about Omaha Beach. But Doc said there wasn't no beaches in Omaha. Whatever the case, Grady had a neat converted Airstream diner with a cool stainless steel counter fronting red padded stools that you could spin around on. The diner was situated diagonally across from the University Hospital complex where most of us had been born. Halfway between it and the junior high school we attended, named after Frederick Douglass Moon. We walked along in silence for a few blocks. I wonder who got popped, Mike said. Nobody got popped, Mike, Rico snapped. A man got shot. Yeah, a man, for real, Calvin added. Like what happened to Kennedy, Rico added angrily. Some cold-blooded shit. Yeah, Doc almost whispered. In slow motion. What was that he kept saying? Please, I answered. He kept saying please. One of the magic words, Calvin said. Please and thank you. But he didn't say thank you. He kind of laughed, ironically. That shit ain't funny, Calvin, Rico muttered. Calvin was the oldest of us. He knew and did everything first. He wound up being the first one of us drafted into the war. Years later, when I learned what a cynic is, I thought of Calvin who served his tour in Vietnam with relative ease. And he might have helped save my life. You see, we had all pledged to be Marines. We wanted to be like Sidney Poitier and Artie Murphy, all the young men. Black heroes doing our duty. We wanted to get out and kill the enemy, whoever that was. Because there was bound to be one. I mean, the rockets had to glare red somewhere, you dig. But years later, in 1968, I got a letter from Calvin mailed from Long Ben Jail in Vietnam. In the letter, he said that he was locked up for refusing to go out on point again while patrolling. 
He said Brothers was always being chosen to take the dangerous point position on patrol. And after being picked several days in a row, he just refused to do it. He said he'd go out and search, but he wasn't going to destroy. And so he got arrested, put in jail, put in jail in the Army. I'll never forget he finished that letter saying, forget the Marine Pledge, dude. Do not come over here. If I see you here, I will shoot you myself. And knowing Calvin, I knew he wasn't lying. That did it for me and the Marines and Vietnam was out of the question because Calvin always meant exactly what he said. His word was his wealth. Wonder what Snow White was about, Doc wondered randomly. I don't know, but I think that cop was right, Rico responded. Bullshit, Calvin said. Whistle while you work, I thought out loud. Yeah, <laughs> what kind of shit is that, Doc said. King Kelly whistles while he works, I remember. And he's the king of the shoe shine, added Calvin. What does a lot of sand mean? I don't know, but it's worth a buck at least, Doc answered. I've been thinking about the so-called future recently. My teacher had been bugging us about what we going to do with our futures if we didn't learn the periodic table of elements. She insisted that if we didn't learn the periodic table of elements, we would end up living down on the whole stroll. <laughs> My house was right off the corner of the busiest corner on the whole stroll. So I never figured out why I should care about the damn periodic table of elements. Didn't learn them. Read poetry instead. Got sent to the office for it. Suddenly, everything seemed unforgettable again. Just for a few heartbeats, everything took on a kind of sepia tone, and I paused, taking a long look at each one of my friends, memorizing them. For some reason, I felt like I'd better be right there, right then. Wake up, Professor. You sleepwalking again? Calvin said, snapping his fingers in my face. That cop ain't ever heard Miles Davis play that song from Snow White, I mumble. Y'all remember when Mr. Brown played the record for us? Yeah, Mike answered excitedly. That's the only reason I wanted to go see the flick. Someday Mike was going to become a great drummer. Calvin was pretty good, too. Because of those two, we ended up all carrying around drumsticks a lot. we drum on everything we found, trash cans, brick walls. It was also good for self-defense. It was Calvin who first weaponized them. So, what's Snow White got to do with us, huh? Rico concluded, whistling while you work? No, nah, man, that's what we got to do with Snow White, Calvin said. We climbed the steps to Grady's and went in, took our places on the red vinyl upholstered stools on which we'd spun since our $400 summer of 61. What's your pleasure, gents? Grady asked, smiling. He always called us gents. Grady was a, a creature of habit and hard work. Kind of like an ant. And he always seemed happy. His smile reminded me of the cop at the east side, but unlike the cop, Grady's kind blue eyes agreed with his smile. The cop had an executioner's smile. The usual, Mr. Grady, I answered, putting out our money. The cops buck. The guys nodded, voicing approval, and kicked in their change. Lunch is on the house today, fellas, the old man said. Say what? We all said in chorus. What? 
grated crack back immediately. There'd be no disappointing surprises at Grady's. It turned out to be just another Saturday after all. The usual. Except for the unexpected free lunch, which never tasted better and almost erased the memory of the movie madness. Almost. After giving Grady's best, the justice it deserved, we headed home, each of us saying goodbye and peeling off as we got to our respective corners. Finally, I was on my own, my street being the last one on my way down by the tracks. Alone, I got to thinking again about the incident at the east side, mostly about the sound of the guy begging for his life. Nothing else sounds like that. Nothing except maybe Ray Charles wailing the word well at the outset of some heartbroken blues. But the irony of the music struck me too. The tequila loop. I ain't comfortable with repetition in general, but the repetition at that particular time, at that particular tune, seemed somehow particularly cursory, if not downright vulgar. A one-word hit song. It struck me in a kind of ecclesiastical way. Now, whenever I hear tequila, I think of someday my prince will come. Think of my homeboys. Think of Snow White and her boys. And oddly enough, I think of Grady and some Omaha beach that I can only imagine in unguarded instance. How many fathers, hundreds of fathers and sons and brothers whispering, please, The same old story with a different name, according to Mark Knopfler. First time I heard that tune, I had to sneak off and cry. I'm thankful that I don't have to sneak off anymore. 